very welcome. I'm so excited about tonight's reading. Um, I have a professional connection to both. Both of our readers have appeared in the Wild Review. Um, I was delighted to see Andrew Wiley in the lobby. Um, and she's connected to our first reader when I was in the Tyrone Guthrie um, about two years ago. I encountered, um, I guess it was in the midst of the Syrian crisis, and I encountered the work of Mara Mal Masri. And I said to Keith Payne, who was the who Theo's book is dedicated to, our first reader, um, and his partner Sue, um, I said, do you, you know, do you know anyone who's interested in her work, who's interested in translating the Syrian poet Mara Mal Masri? And he said, well. Um, I know I know something better than that. I know some, someone translating her her collections, and that, and that was Theo. So that was wonderful. We published two of his translations in our first issue. Um, so Theo is from Cork. He lives in Dublin. Um, he's sort of ambassadorial in his output for, for poetry and his efforts, what he's represented for Ireland and abroad. And in terms of his awards, he's won many. He's won the Poetry Now Award for Nine Bright Shiners. Um, he's a very accomplished editor and translator, and his latest collection is a encounter with the myth of Orpheus, a sort of recasting, reinvigoration of that myth, um, and there's sort of a lot of transpositions to different places and dialogue with other people, with Bob Dylan and Johnny Mitchell. It's a very sensitive, very reflective <laughs> collection. Um, I guess one of my favourite iterations was when the underground was transposed to a metro stop in Paris. Um, and with Sasha, our second reader, um, I, uh, we published a little series of postcards and the rationale was to, for me to go into the farm gate and pick out poems that I liked in random journals that were stocked there for 20 odd years. And one of the poems, the first poem I picked was Sasha's poem about Anna Akhmatu, um, Anna Akhmatova, <laughs> which I've said wrong for uh, 10 years. And um, yeah, so um, we uh, sort of, I'm, I'm sort of sorry, retrograding here, but essentially I had written to Sasha about publishing a translation of Anna Akhmatova, and she already had it ready basically in her inbox, so it's a wonderful synchronicity. Um, Sasha is a profoundly talented translator. She's been a sort of um, a mentor and a sort of the stewardship that she's done for Russian translation. She's translated core figures like um, Mandelstam and I'm not, am I going to do it again? I'm going to say it again. Akhmatova. <laughs> and um, she's published four collections of Karkanesh, most recently Joy, which was the Poetry Book Society choice. Um, and she was the editor of Modern Poetry Translation for around five years. Um, these, both of these poets, so have, on a personal, I suppose professional level, given me gifts as an editor for their dedication to translation and their gifts that we've given to us with their with their output in their own in their own original work. So it's Theo first and then Sasha. So thank you. I was explaining to Sasha that um, in Cork and and the Rigan Akmatha is known as Akmatova <laughs> because Cork English cannot resist a broad O. <laughs> and also it makes it possible to Akmatova, <laughs> slightly further, so who does she think she is? <laughs> Possibly the greatest poet of the 20th century is the answer to that. Um, you'll have gathered that I am not Kate, who is in the programme. At least I hope you have, because of a serious identity crisis if it's not immediately obvious. I want to thank Pat for the invitation to come off the bench. <laughs> and I can in French. Mitch should have made better use of the bench last Saturday, but that's neither here nor there. Um, because I admire Sasha's work so much, um, I thought I'd offer a hostage to fortune and start with two points set in Moscow. Because um, after all, why not? Um, the first one is called At the Lubyanka in this politically conscious city, I do not need to explain what Lubyanka was or what its implications were. 
No cues yesterday, Anna Achmatova, at the black icebound gates of Cresty Prison. Tonight a bride in a veil of lace walks hand in hand with her young man through grim Zerzinskaya of eternal shame without a backward or a sideways glance. The bell of her laughter and defunct your requiem. Now that the terror has changed key, now that it drifts like ash, like funeral music through the veins of the wide world, tell me, where will the grief of mothers find the point of its pure expression? Where should we hope to find now a voice like yours? What about somewhere? Somewhere there is a simple life. The snow dredged through a strand of birch, tracks of a rabbit in the snow, the path indented on a white page. Track of the woodcutter, the solitary doctor, the child trailing homeward to soup, firelight, mother. I hold this vision in my cupped hands, a dome of light on the bare table. There was anguish in that ornament, the shaken snow made the plastic cottage frail. I almost remember the trail home, sitting at home in firelight, tasting the soup of another life. Mother, I have been in the cold places I dreamed of when you were proud of your bright son. The day the bus went by the back road to Sheremetyevo, I snatched Berioska from the rattle of pale trunks, the ward echoing. Tracks of a rabbit in the snow, my own tracks crossing the trail of childhood. Never again, my mother, those conversations by firelight. Somewhere, somewhere there is a simple life. For some reason, probably an imp of mischief, I'm remembering Miles Nagopoulin, who um, was picked up on a reference in the Irish Times to um, the, the, the passion that O'Connor had for Trudeau and he, he made remarks on the effect of the Russians, as you know that introspective crowd from Cork. <laughs> <laughs> this is how he explained Cork's passion for Russia. Um, while we watch the unfolding black comedy that is Brexit, it's been no harm to remind ourselves that our own Doyle is not exclusively populated by geniuses of political philosophy, <laughs> keen analysts of world trends, statesmen and stateswomen all. Um, I stole the title shamelessly from Father Benjamin, the angel of history. In the Parliament House on Kildare Street, the lamps were burning. It was a winter night, the usual slant rain falling. I had paused to light up a cigarette, to watch the lone guard stamp her feet, blow uselessly into her cupped gloved hands. In the colonnade of the National Library, a man was standing, a man neither old nor young, his head bare, half turned towards the lights in the Parliament House, the high blank windows. I saw him reach inside his long, loose coat, take out a notebook. I crossed the road, gathering my own long coat around me, stood in behind him, looked over his shoulder. He paid me no heed. One after another, I saw him strike them out from a long list of names, senators, deputies, ministers. One after another, the names dissolved on the page, a scant dozen remaining. I watched him ink in a question mark after each of these, neat and precise. He put the book away, sliding it down carefully into a deep pocket. He turned and looked at me, nothing like pity in those hollow eyes. He sighed, then squared his shoulders, lifted his face to the rain, and was gone. Gone as if he had never been. But I saw him. I know who he was. I witnessed that cold, exact cancellation. Walked on, walked home, thoughtful, afraid for my country. 
I keep promising myself that one of these days, if only to lighten the atmosphere at readings, I write something funny. <laughs> <laughs> no luck so far. <clears throat> Many of you here will remember Deirdre Meany, wonderful artist and a gentle, lovely soul. Um, Deirdre and Morris, her life's love, were in um, France um, when Deirdre died. And the, um, the epigraph that this poem is taken from a notation she'd made in her diary. Going to the chateau. <clears throat> Happiness today was a field ablaze with poppies. Tomorrow we are going to see the chateau. Except, of course, being at home, I should say, tomorrow we are going to see the chateau. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in Deirdre's voice, as I imagine. Listen, my darling, listen, the wind going over. That dry green meadow down there below, I'm watching it come and go the way your look does, going out to the horizon and settling on my neck, my long hair blowing free. You draw on a cigarette, taking me in, that way you have so many years now. The best I had of this life was in your look through smoke dancing as the door blew open, or walking down Wellington Road in the early morning, or climbing that Via Dolorosa in winter rain. Your eyes catching mine, sometimes black points of fire, more often so deep going in and seeing me, I would catch my breath. I was a stranger wandering this earth until I found home with you. Everything that we ever did was right. Everywhere that we walked, lay, climbed, or swam was a spur and nurture to curiosity. Your virtuoso flourishes with the brush, or mine and dies, a, a kind of guarantee, invocation of the world when it's being itself. Sweetheart, stretch out your arms and let your eye be dry and exact now as it ever was. Look a last time on these my bones, place poppies on my breast, measure me, make me a bed of silence to be my home, or oh, bring me home. But first, we are going to see the famous chateau. Are you afraid? Don't be. I knew you wouldn't be. Take my hand, be shy again with me, be strong now more than ever, and I will carry your look with me to the door. Breathe in my mouth and press my lips, my poppy lips. Remember me, such a rich and true life as we made. Be proud of me as I have been proud of you. Remember these poppies, this lush, darkening field, this cold, oncoming, starry rush of night. Um, Michael Longley gave voice to what a thousand poets have said. He was asked once, if he knew where poetry came from, and he said, perhaps just a little glibly, if I knew that, I'd go and live there. <laughs> Poems come from all sorts of strange places, always from other words, of course. But um, this one came from a, a complete near tragic misunderstanding. You know the phrase um, in, in Cork, it's, uh, it's a challenge. I'll have, come outside and I'll have you. Yeah, some of you, the, maybe the rougher elements of the audience are familiar <laughs> with the phrase. Um, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a double faced phrase, you know. You know, we say um, the, the line comes from um, the line, the title on it, um, Death Will Come and Have Your Eyes, the first line, comes from the poem by Cesare Pavese. And what he meant was, Death Will Come and Have Your Eyes, in the same way that you would say, A hawk would swoop out of the blue and have the eyes out of the lamp. Mm -hmm. But we're perhaps more familiar with a more prosaic version where you look into the crown. And you say, aren't he lovely? He had his mother's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so the poem came from a complete misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. On a day far from now. I, 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 I should say, by the way, that I have been abused for the past for writing such a morose love poem. <laughs> I don't understand that. On a day far from now. Death will come and have your eyes. And I will go into her arms without fear or hesitation. Frost on the slates of our beloved square, the cars riding low under a hurrying sky, when I open the great hall door and take her hand, her long black coat. The bare flagged hallway, 
frost and perfume on the night air. I watch her let down her gleaming hair, open her slender arms in your exact gesture. Death will come and have your eyes, and I will go into her arms alone and unafraid. We have a lunatic dog at the moment. We, we, we got him from the pantry where he was already christened Rio. The second day we had him, he ate half the kitchen, so he became Rio Loco. And he's now displayed an extraordinary talent, the only dog I've ever heard of with this capacity, for escaping from a harness. You know the ones that go around behind the legs as well? You should see him do it. So he's no Rio Loco Houdini. <laughs> He suffers from comparison with the angel his angelic predecessor, Bella. <laughs> Night walk with the dog, Bella. The tide is going out on the burrow beach, the long murmur, the suck and hiss. Night and the islands under the full moon float at their moorings, nudge and show. One of those nights when talks beyond our reach, each of us wearing a single glove, the better to hold him. You scuff your shoes, the dog carefully watching our every move. And this is all we need to know of love. Three souls walking the beach, the tide going out that will come in again, the dog content, the faded stars above. Still silent, buoyant, we stop, we turn to kiss. And the black dog goes chasing down the moon. The fascinating thing I think about myths is that once you have the armature, once you have the basic architecture, as history mutates and we shift and change with it, the myth bears new readings always. And that's one of the ways we can distinguish the true myths. Is they will constantly bear new meanings. And I've always been fascinated by the notion, this rather disturbing notion that um, poor Eurydice was stuck down there in hell, but Orpheus went down to say for I'm thinking, well, maybe she wanted to be down there. That's not an unfamiliar thing that we sometimes we must go down into the dark to make other souls. And so in which in this I, I wrote two different versions of the myth the counterposing. Um, and in this book, which is in two parts, um, I've been straining not to think of it as a novel in verse. In the first half it's set more or less contemporary to the extent, the vanishing extent to which I am contemporary. Um, the young lad grows up and it might be Cork, Pope might be the Phoenix. I say no more than that. Um, and he falls for Horus. He encounters um, a version of the Belle Dame Sans Merci, someone who is fated in contrast with her own darkness. And they try to make a go of it, and she challenges him to make his own songs, not just to become a perfect exponent of cover versions, which is what he starts out wanting, but to make his own songs. And well, the second half plays with them when Orpheus was torn apart by the mine lads and cast into the ocean, his head drifted ashore eventually at the north cave of Lesbos. And um, it came to me that he was put together again to learn better. Um, some idiot reviewed this and said that uh, he settles at last for domesticity. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He finds a way to trust the lyric gift and still live in the world we all share. Hers are growing up in a small town, I suppose. Anyway, I got to read two sections. That was vicious of me, wasn't it? <laughs> but you know, why not? I forgive myself. Uh, I just read two sections from the first part and two from the, the second one. I gave myself to her, a fall fueled by need. Deep in her aura of turbulent dreams at night, in the strong air she inhabited by day. I never paid heed to the small warnings that flashed up in my mind, the darts of unease, quick doubts, hesitations, something she might say or do. I was somehow of her kind, that's all I knew. At least, that's what I believed, or needed to believe, wanted to think through. Sometimes, it was all too much for me, this dark energy, but I fed on it too, felt the roots of day stirred and disturbed, untwisting, 
to search blind tips ever downward into the old hard ground, down to the cold clay. And as Sarah points out, um, they break up in Paris, which is tradition for car couples. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so here's your other clay, if you like. Up it on, if you like. Down at the end, it stares the metro. Oh, I marked the wrong page. Huh. Yes. Metro Saint-Michel. Everything much too loud after a day of silence by the river. At the interchange, I plunge out, unheeding, shouldering through crowds to the far escalator. I turn, look back. She stood there looking up, deep wells of sorrow in her eyes. From the turbulent crowd she signs, I just can't go on. Hard fluorescent light, waterfall of black noise, then a fainting away of all except that resolute, beseeching figure, her unbearable poise. I batter my way down, panic struck, fearing the worst, a loud hiss, the sound of doors closing, rumbling rubber wheels, light on the last carriage, red, vanishing, gone. And the other lad, back then, or in the eternal nose, back then. Back in the long before I was enchanter and arrogant with the gift I could make stones move, men made me famous for it with their talk, muttered sorcerer as I passed, silently crowding to my heels, and I confess I liked it, the awe they felt, a kind of sustaining echo to my own cold air to anneal the blade of thought. Now I am found enchanted. The song sings me and gives me pause. The God intends this. Such has been made known. Reborn in silence, I have recanted belief in my power, surrendered my one art to itself. By sea, by cliff, by woods I walk, tending the busy music of what happens, entranced with my part. And just a quick reference to his gathering understanding of where he went wrong with Eurydice. I lay on my back, a starfish, softly borne up on warm night water, held out to the stars, her sails quietly streaming through the sky, a glinting bee swarm, a shoal of patterning milk. Walls of the cove gave back the heat of day, gave scent to the salt air. I loved her, but not enough. The thought came soft through the night above, settled clear in my mind. Eurydice, dear one, I see now where I went wrong, what I failed to understand then and since. When I stood there, watched you disappear, took death inside, it was my pride that ruled me and not my heart. I thought you mine, thought I owed and owned you, did not see you had made your choice. Dear heart, forgive me. I'll finish with a, a slightly longer poem, but still, I hope, inside the time, because all these years I still haven't learned to check the starting time. <laughs> I hope I know if I'm inside the time if I don't check the starting time. I never learned that. But you're becoming nice and quiet and receptive for Sasha, which is a very good one. <laughs> um, some years ago, Caroline Duffy was putting together an anthology. She asked some people to pick a favourite poem and write a response. <coughs> and with the characteristic modesty of my native city, <laughs> I decided that my favourite poem was, and it is, Cavafy's Ithaca. Oh, okay. So I decided to myself, should I have a go at writing a response? <laughs> <laughs> Court modesty. And I've been thinking about it. It took him seven years to sail from Ithaca to Troy. And depending on which version, which I do check, either 10 years or 20 years to come home. And I was thinking to myself, he was in no great hurry to get back to the farm. <laughs> so I was thinking, what would happen towards the end if, as would be common at the time, if 
Penelope died before him, and Telemachus has gone off and set up his own life. What will Odysseus do? And of course it's obvious. He'll build himself a wee boat and sail out again. <laughs> I could, if I really wanted to, test you to say, this is exactly what happened. I was told this by the spirits. I really get it in the neck of the Irish time, so I start saying things the next time. Oh, the bitter word. So, here's our lad. He, he's not going to sit there checking his EU headish payments for the sheep. He's not going to be sitting there wondering, if, you know, is there enough wood for the fire? Will I be cold? He's going to build a boat and sail back out of it. When you set out from Ithaca again, let it be autumn, early, the plain leaves falling as you go, for spring would shake you with its quickening, its whispers of youth. You will have earned the road down to the harbour, duty discharged, your toll of labour paid, the house four square, your son in the full of fatherhood, his mother, your long beloved, gone to the shades. Walk by the doorways, do not look left or right, do not inhale the wood smoke, the shy glow of the young girls, the resin and pride of hope. Stand there and hold their gaze, they have been good neighbours. Flank fitted to flank, slow work and sure, the mast straight as your back, water and wine, oil, salt and bread, take a hand in yours for luck. Cast off the lines without a backward glance, and sheet in the sail. There will be harbours, shelter from weather. There will be long, empty passages far from land. There may be love or kindness. Do not count on this, but allow for the possibility. Be ready for storms. When you take leave of Ithaca round to the south, then Strike far down for Circe Calypso, what you remember, what you must keep in mind. Trust to your course, long since laid down for you. There was never any question of turning back. All those who came the journey with you, those who fell to the flesh of bronze, those who turned away into other fates, are long gathered to asphodel and dust. You will go uncompanioned, but go you must. There will be time in the long days and nights, stunned by the sun or driven by the stars to unwind your spool of life. You will learn again what you always knew. The wind sweeps everything away. When you set out from Ithaca again, you will not need to ask where you are going. Give every day your full reflective attention, the rise and flash of the swell on your beam, the lift into small harbours. And do not forget Ithaca. Keep Ithaca in your mind, all that it was and is and will be without you. Be grateful for where you have been, for those who kept to your side, those who strode out ahead of you or stood back and watched you sail away. Be grateful for kindness in the perfumed dark. But sooner or later, you will sail out again. And some morning, some clear night, you will come to the pillars of Hercules. Sail through if you wish. You are free to turn back. Go forward on deck. Lay your hand on the mast. Hear the wind in its dipping branch. Now you are free of home and journeying, rocked on the cusp of tides. Ithaca is before you. Ithaca is behind you. Man is born homeless and shaped for the sea. You must do what is best. Dramatic.
Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Theo, for that hard act to follow. And some recyclable. <laughs> I was going to start by reading um, from Joy, um, but I thought, actually, in light of what Sarah and Theo were saying, I would read something about Russian literature and about Ahmatova. I didn't realise that Cork had such a passion for Russian poetry. You speak a bit So this poem is a response to Ahmatova's poem. Um, Ahmatova has a, a cycle of ten poems called Secrets of the Craft. Mm -hmm. Bet you'd all like to know what those are. Um, <laughs> and this poem um, responds to one of those poems in which she says, where does poetry come from? She gives a list of very ordinary objects where poetry might come from um, and, and, and it in effect says it's a secret really where poetry comes from. But this is the response to that poem. I wrote it a few years ago and I'm going to read it on my phone because I didn't bring it with me, which is already a, a slightly adrenaline filled activity for me. <laughs> um, and it's, it's called Perhaps Ahmatova Was Right. Perhaps Ahmatova was right when she wrote, Who knows what shit, what tip, what pile of waste brings forth the tender verse, like hogweed, like the fat hen under the fence, like the unbearable present tense. Who knows what ill, what strife, what crude shack of a life and how it twists sweetly about the broken sill. Pressingness, another word for honeysuckle. But housewives, has poetry ever deepened in the pale? Was it ever found in the sink, under the table? Did it rise in the oven, quietly able to outhowl the hoover? Does it press more than the children's supper the sudden, sleepless wail, did it ever? It lives, it takes seed, like the most unforgiving weed, grows wilder as the child grows older, and spits on dreams. Did I say how it thrives in the ashen family nest, or how I ams are measured best where it hurts, with the heel of an iron on the reluctant breast, of a shirt. <coughs> the title poem of my, uh, my most recent book, Joy, is a monologue spoken by the widow of William Blake, Catherine Blake, and I was going to read uh, a short part of that now. It was actually a commission, another Russian link, it was a commission by the Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts in Moscow, <coughs> And it was written to accompany an exhibition of William Blake, I think one of the first exhibitions of Blake in Russia. And unsurprisingly, the Russians really, really responded well to Blake's art. Um, I found it incredibly hard to write. The idea was that I would write something, I suppose, in the voice of Blake. But Blake is so extraordinary, extraordinary and idiosyncratic and larger than life that I found it really, really hard to find a, a sort of chink in the armour. And I ended up... Um, suddenly beginning to write in the voice of his widow, Catherine Blake, and, um, and that's what the monologue became. Um, what I need to say is that Catherine and William Blake, if you, um, you don't know, m married very young in their early 20s, lived together for 50 years, and during those 50 years, Blake um, and, and Catherine Blake lived side by side, worked side by side on the engraving, the drawing, um, the printing, and it was not an easy business. It was a cottage industry, and no less um, appalling in its conditions than the industries we know about in the 18th and 19th century. It's a lot of chemicals involved, a lot of heavy manual labour, um, and Catherine did that with William for 50 years, and then was left when he died. And um, so, in a sense, this is a reflection on how it feels to lose a partner, but also how to lose a, um, a creative life and be left. See my hands? Here, look. You said they were the hands of a craftsman. Where to put them? <coughs> they have never lain so long in my lap. They begin to gnaw at the air. 
two twisted vessels, all the craft trickles out of them. All day they worked, these memory hands, and he was beside me, working with his graver or printing at the press. I don't remember once that he faltered or considered how or what or why. He wrote and drew and painted as if something else painted through him, and I coloured and sometimes drew as if he was drawing through me, and humility was in both of us because we were instruments and equal in our apprenticeship. No time for death. No, death had no business nosing round. Caught you, says death, if you stand still. That's why children never catch their death. They are too quick for death. They slip past it. And if they don't, then the angels come and release them. He called down to them, innocent creatures, and drew them little portraits on slips of paper. I wished for children. I wished and wished. I patted their sprite heads and pulled them to me, their ghostly bodies, lifted them, weightless, into my lap, dandled their spirits. But God had put me on the earth for other things. God had put me on the earth to be an instrument and a companion and a lover. I bore him no children. He was my child and I was his, and we were to each other brother and sister, parent and child, man and wife. And when we made love, we made love threefold, across the generations and the sexes and the sacred prohibitions, and we made love as one. I didn't know what love was, nor did he. We were each other's pupils, and he sat brooding and looking and then threw himself down and wept that every shred of him was a harlot. But that I understood. I was wiser than he, and I took his hand and I told him, between two moments, bliss is ripe. He looked, his eyes shone. How can this be sinful, he cried. Generous love, how can we feel shame? There is no shame in this love, but only in self-love that envies watching with its lamp-like eyes the frozen marriage bed. But our narrow bed is warm and close, and two gods dwell there. That's what he said. Come and lie with me, Kate. Come now to bed. Come now to bed. My bed is empty. Where are you? My bed is empty. They have made me up a bed in a downstairs room because I cannot walk far, and the bed is clean and white. So I lie in it obediently, knowing that it is to be my winding cloth. The old woman can't sleep. Give her valerian. The old woman can't sleep for remembering. Give her morphine. The old woman is a cold rock in black space. Give her back the sun. The walls are wordless. There is a clock ticking. I have woken up from a dream of abundant colour and joy. I see his face and he is a shepherd and a piper and a god. I see him bent by the grate, setting the fire, and he is a fallen demon. I see him listening to the wind and sorrowing. I see wrath and misery, fire and desolation. A thousand fires in ancient London, and then the grass comes silent, silent, with the hardest colour of all, the mirth colour, the corn colour, the summer night colour. A thousand, thousand summer nights pass, and children weave their daisy chains and place them on the heads of fallen idols. He wept. He wept more tears than there were days, and never chained the door, lest, he said, we drive an angel from it. And every morning he dipped his brush in wrath and mildness, and out of him tumbled the biggest things of all, all of them writer than the rightest calculation, and truer than any compass, yet where they were right and true, none could say. And how they were right and true, none could guess. 
but I knew. I knew. He was an eye, and the eye wept and frowned and smiled. The eye watched, the eye watered. The world was a moat in that eye. The moat was a world in that eye, and his brush was a blade, and his tears made a lake. How I ache, how I ache. Sole partner, and sole part of all these joys, he read to me in the summer house where we sat when Mr. Butts came knocking and found us naked, reading as we read every warm day. The poor man liked to tell that story to everyone as proof of the wildness of our life, though it never did seem wild to me, but consistent in all respects and full of holy sobriety, which looks to the untrained eye like wild joy. William stood then and made a deep bow to Satan, who had been watching, and said, You are welcome to our garden, sir. Satan had a round, sad face like a water wheel, and seemed tired and full of pity. He wore his rainbow snake around him, and when he saw we meant him no harm, he bowed and shriveled to a vapour. But Mr. Butts came in and ate some grapes. <laughs> I'm just going to read um, two more poems. One is um, for uh, Jerry Smith, who was here earlier in the week, um, and I was talking to him about the uh, Dublin painter Sean Scully. I had to do a sort of commission for Newcastle on a painting by Sean Scully, and if you know the work of Sean Scully, it's sort of abstract grids, quite a few of his works are grids, and um, quite difficult to write about. Um, but, he, but, he, but Scully writes so beautifully about art that there is always plenty to respond to in his writings. And he has this phrase that I particularly loved, I always go to yellow to fight death. Um, and in, I've also been looking at the same time at the writings of Goethe, and Goethe writes has a colour um, association chart as well. But in Goethe's chart, yellow is associated with usury, sulphur, um, and I was interested in contrasting these two, two views of a colour which essentially has nothing in it except itself. Pigment. I always go to yellow to fight death. I always go to red to fight insomnia, and blue to fight addiction, and green feeds my need for approval. But the semitones, they get under my skin, the nipple pink of palimpsest, sage for the menopause, navy blue for rape, grey for greased rope, and buttercream for infanticide. The ochres give me a long history of anti-Semitism, and when they flare and crumble, then I see battlefields. No, not red, but violet black is the mortal colour. Sparrow brown is the day dawning on the field. Mint green beds the broken flints. I always go to gold to feel disgust and desire. The desert road planked with barracks is gold. Mucus is dirt gold. Corn is tooth gold. But scythed, it yields to ash. When a train passes, I crouch down on the embankment to watch the uniform black stars raining on the ballast, fight exile with indigo, gauze white, and the maroon wheel of an old wound. When I go to yellow, it is the debased colour of survival, sulphurous, bankrupt, and sometimes tinged with a green that borders on darkness. Darkness is a hymn I go to when I wish to fight light when reasonable light shovels itself brick red over all the cities and hills, and the clouds look like dust, which looks like smoke. <coughs> and I want to finish with a, um, another poem, which is uh, I was asked to edit one of these really beautiful candlesticks uh, um, editions, ten poems, about walking. I'm a really keen walker, but as is usual, when you try and walk, write about something that you're really keen on, it's, it's incredibly hard. And um, 
but for a long time I couldn't think of anything to say. And then I went to see uh, a, a really beautiful sculpture, ceramic sculpture by Rachel Kneebone, and it has all sorts of limbs falling. It's the sort of fall of the rebel angels, if you know that very traditional visual image. So this poem is called The Fall of the Rebel Angels, and I'll finish with it. And before I read it, I'd like to say thank you so much to the festival for inviting me and to Cork um, for its wonderful hospitality and for all the heroes of literature here like Patrick and Sarah Byrne and um, James and the volunteers who help with the festival. Thank you very much. I've had a really beautiful time. This is The Fall of the Rebel Angels. They didn't fall. It wasn't a pillar of legs and arms a downpour of limbs, a shaft of flesh like a rainstorm, dark over the sea. And they walked. They shouldered packs, <coughs> raised boots, adjusted straps. In high-spec technical wear, fleeces, gaiters, fearless, the angels dropped from mountain top and picked through the debris of rock, hopped over pavements, sundew. Grikes down scarps and slopes, entering the world on the thinnest paths, the GRs from the stars, the trails, the aura of a rope team on a glacier, the scramble, the clumsy jump, the odd angel on a bog, jumping like a man from clump to clump of cotton grass, falling into mud on a seraphic arse over stiles and gates and shifting slate in dry stone walls, built before the world knew how to fall, and bathing in tarns, marvelling at lambs, napping under pines, walking, walking in angelic lines. And when they slept, their up till then unused legs kept walking in their sleep. Their dreams were of rights of way, and even when the coming of day meant binding feet and the dampness of wings, still they hoisted their packs and took their flasks and walked and walked, lacing the land with endless small tracks, which led where angels did not fear to tread down into valleys and snaking over passes, shining tracks, visible to the naked eye, the man in glasses, the woman holding a map, Daily trespassing angels, angels who walked and fell from grace into mountain streams. Forgive us our lack of dreams. We have forgotten how to rebel. Thank you. So I, ha I have an interview style, which is to ask one completely bizarre question and, and one practical question. I'm going to, from your poem, Days, um, I'm super interested in, in paradoxes in my own work. I didn't learn it all, Sasha, sorry. It, it's about, every, it's, it's just really right that everything has its opposite. So, this is the bizarre one, just so you don't have to wonder. <laughs> so, what, what, what's, the, what's the opposite of poetry for you, and, and how do you cope with it? Both of you, the same question. <laughs> I'm completely dumbstruck. <laughs> I don't write very often or very much. I'm not somebody who writes a lot and then scraps work. I write very, very rarely. So actually the opposite of poetry is kind of everything else. <laughs> And you cope with that okay? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Theo, for you? I like the formula, sorry, I need this one. I like the formula that poetry is a way of telling the truth by means of lies. Mm -hmm. So I think if poetry is the truth and lies, the opposite of poetry is lies as lies. <laughs> well, take that one out. <laughs> <laughs> Senior hurling out, sir, you're going to ask for questions, you're going to get awkward answers. <laughs> no problem. Now here's the normal one. It's a Jonathan uh, who is very particular about the, the terror, the terror in writing. Because um, you both, you're both translators, you both uh, plays, um, lots of different forms, and, and, and how it's a theme over the week how poetry sort of parachutes down and stuff. And 
how much of what you're doing now is a synthesis of, of, of all of your roles, editing <coughs> with, with journals, with anthologies, in terms of what do you feel most comfortable in, in terms of all those roles? Or do all those roles equate to being a writer? I'm, I'm one of the, I think when poets talk about translation, usually they talk about it as a really good thing mm -hmm. for their own work. Yes. And that is true, but it's also uh, something that stands in the way of your own work. So while you're translating someone else's voice, you're not writing your own mm -hmm. poetry. So um, I, I do see translation as part of my practice and I love it, but I also um, resent it mm -hmm. too because I'm, I'm not working on my own stuff. But then there's an element to poetry that it's, it's the hardest thing to do. So anything um, else is, is great work avoidance. Um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, hoovering, um, <laughs> baking, <laughs> baking yeah. emptying the dishwasher, and translating other people's poems. Yeah. Uh, so for you, is it, is it a distraction, or is it very fortifying? Is it necessary? Or? Well, I'm not quite sure. Um, I know, I've been saying this for years, and absolutely nobody, well, maybe a handful of people believe, I mean it literally, literally, literally. We don't write the poems, the poems write us. And everybody thinks I'm being as if or metaphoric, and I mean it that way. So if the poems aren't writing themselves through me, I mean, we do the hard work afterwards when we have to reshape them and try to make an, an architecture, a matrix to sustain what there is of the poem, but the poem announces itself and finds its, announces its own proposed frontiers, and you try to make something that will hold it. So the double sense of craft, as we say, about a boat that was sail on the river of language, as well as the craft of the ship writing. Um, translation is a different thing. Translation is a will encounter. You come across somebody. There is an element of calling. When I translated Maram al Masri, it was because I walked into a bookshop in Paris, and you know, the books are flat on tables, and I put my hand down just prop myself up really and look around. Then I lifted my hand and um, what became Barefoot Souls was the book and I picked it up and looked at it and thought, oh yeah, okay. But I did nothing about it for three years, two years or three years. And then one day I sat down in a panic and thought, I have to do something. It's the first of January, I've done nothing all winter. And I found it was just waiting to be there. And then I, I've done a third one and I was trying to home for it. But the next book that I know that's coming out, because there are a few out there looking for homes, is um, <laughs> that I've got hubris. It's translation of Lorca's Gypsy Ballads into Irish. Right? So I'm translating from a language I barely have, although I count on my residual Latin for the Spanish and the dictionaries, into what uh, Sean O'Riordan memorably described as on Tiangashog Latyong, this language half with me. So that was an interesting exercise. And I'm still absolutely baffled as to whether the adjective following the noun in the Tishit Ginnithuk should always be in the Tishit Ginnithuk, or whether I can say in the Avenue. So um, there are different schools of thought about that, by the way. So. But that, in a way, I mean, translating Moran directly from the French was straightforward, because I could translate it myself. I mean, I had to go to the dictionary to be sure about things. But uh, translating for a rudimentary, the language you have a rudimentary grasp of, now I checked it back against various English translations and meticulously pieced out line by line the thing. The problem is that you've got eight syllables to a line in the Lorca ballads. You can't do that in Irish. The language is too expansive. So I ended up trying to find a musical equivalent in the language. And that to me is the puzzler's fascination. And to me that's, that's the attraction of translation for me is the puzzling out of it because it's an oblique way of learning your trade but when you come to making the matrix to hold a poem in English when it comes and I have found that every time I did something did one of Moran's books something happened to the poems I would subsequently write in English I suppose I'm belatedly learning my trade you know and translation can be a help in that yeah this kind of sense of a book on your book on your yeah, but I could also, I suspect, I could probably say the exact opposite of what I've just said on a different day and a different view. It's okay, I'll ask you tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you very um, much. So the last book, oh, I always do that, Corkism. 
the, our guest books <laughs> 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 are outside for sale. Uh, 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 Theo's most recent OFB is from, from not just last year, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Cool. And uh, uh, Joy uh, from Fashion. So, and they'd be delighted to sign those for you and ask any questions. So, if you could go around the floor. Thank you.